We'll be continuing chapter 40 with sectioning the airway. So as a CNA, you are not allowed to suction an airway. It is not within the scope of practice in the state of California. But again, you will be there when suctioning is happening. You may be asked to hold things, to hand things to um, the nurse or the respiratory therapist. So generally, there are two types of suctioning. There is a, what we call a Yankauer suction. You probably have seen those if you go to the dentist, you get your teeth cleaned, they put that suction in there to kind of suck up all those secretions that are in your mouth. Or there is a catheter suction where they can go through an endotracheal tube, um, through a tracheostomy tube and put it down into the lungs where the secretions are. And then when they cover their, th it's hooked up to a suction device. And then when this is covered, it applies suction. So there's no suction as you're putting the tube down into the lungs. The suction is applied as it's coming out. When a nurse or a respiratory therapist is suctioning, they should suction for no more than 10 seconds, okay? Um, because you have to realize that when a person is suctioning, they're not just taking secretions out of the lungs, they're also removing oxygen out as well. So it can be very dangerous. So generally what you're going to see is, the, is someone will cut, use a bag mass valve and they'll give the person some extra oxygen and then the person will suction them because we know it's going to suck out extra oxygen and then we'll um, give them a few more breaths of oxygen right after the suctioning as well. But this is a great way to get suctioning or secretions from down in the lungs. Now, if your person needs long-term ventilatory support, you obviously aren't going to be able to stand there and bag them for the rest of their life. So they will be hooked up to a machine called a mechanical ventilator. Now, the mechanical ventilator can be hooked up to an endotracheal tube that goes through the mouth. That's that short, the tube that's usually only put in for six weeks. Or what you're seeing here in this example, this is a, it's attached to a tracheostomy tube. So this tubing here, the oxygen is coming through and going into the tubing and the machine will be set with what the rate is going to be, how much volume it's going to push into the lungs. Um, so all of those will be calculated out what the doctor will decide that the patient needs. Now, one thing is, is if an alarm sounds, um, you do not turn the alarm off because then it's not going to warn anybody else. So we don't want you to turn off the alarm. If it has just become disconnected, so let's say this tubing has popped off of the connection of the tracheostomy tube, as a CNA, we will actually let you just connect it right back on and go get the nurse because you've got to remember that if there's no air going into this person, this person is not breathing during that whole time you're trying to find the nurse or the respiratory therapist. So usually with uh, the CNAs, I guess it will, it will depend on the facility you work at, but they do allow the CNAs just to attach the tubing if it's popped off, just attach it back on and then go get the nurse or the respiratory therapist to check it. Don't turn the alarms off. Other things to keep in mind when a person is getting mechanical ventilation is communication is going to be a huge problem for this person. They are not going to be able to talk when they have a vent mechanical ventilator breathing for them, whether it's going through an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy tube while that machine is breathing for them, this person is not going to be able to talk. And that is extremely terrifying to people, obviously. So we are going to need to come up with different ways for communication techniques, whether it's um you know, a point, a, a click and point type of board, if they can write something out. Um, but we want to make sure that we're um, realizing that they are going to be scared. So we do want to make sure we're giving them lots of comfort and reassurance that we're explaining everything that's happening to them and that their call light is always in reach because this is such a terrifying thing for a person to have a machine pushing air into their lungs and then not be able to talk or communicate to a person. Um, another thing that we might see, not in a nursing home, I have not seen this in a nursing home, but if you do work as a CNA in a hospital, this is a really common thing to see. And this is a chest tube. So chest tubes are inserted when there's air, blood, or fluid that collects in the pleural space. So I think in one of the other um, lectures we talked about, we have our lung tissue and then we have the chest wall and there's a space between the lung tissue and the chest wall. And that's called the pleural space. So if that pleural space fills up with air, so let's say the person gets a hole in their lungs and the air, instead of staying in their lung, it's filling up this pleural space. It's called a pneumothorax. Air in the pleural space is pneumothorax. 
if let's say they had damage to their lungs, they were in a car accident, they hit their chest with a steering wheel, um, and they've got blood leaking into this pleural space, it would be a hemothorax, meaning blood in the pleural space. And if they have an infection or a collection of fluid going on in the pleural space, it would be called a pleural effusion. Now, those are not conducive to a person being able to breathe correctly. So what they would do is they would put a chest tube. So in this example down here, you see um, fluid building up in the lung and it's keeping the lung from being able to fully inflate. And that way that's obviously going to keep the person from oxygenating well. And as this fluid increases in this area, that lung's going to collapse even more. So what they would do is they would stick a chest tube in here and drain the fluid out so the person's lung can re-expand correctly. So you see here on this example, we have a pneumothorax where we've got air filling up that pleural space. But again, if it's filling up with air, it's it's changing the thoracic pressures in the chest and it's not letting that chest, the, the lung itself, inflate. So this part of the lung is not getting enough oxygen and so they're not going to be oxygenating well. So the physician would put a chest tube in that would suck out, it would be attached to suction and it's going to take all that extra air out of there so the lung can reinflate, reinflate correctly and start bringing in oxygen into the lung tissue. Oh, let me back up here here. The chest tubes are extremely uncomfortable. They're very, very painful. Um, extra tubing you want looped up on top of the bed, not a bunch of tubing looped up down here. Um, we always make, there's always a dressing put over here. And then it's going to go to a collection chamber. So if there's air coming out of the chest tube, it will come here. And so you'll just see bubbling happen. There will be some fluid in here, some water in here, and it'll be bubbling because the air's coming in. If you have a hemothorax where there's blood in the in that pleural space, you'll see blood actually draining and filling this chamber up. And we would calculate that in our intake and output that we talked about a few weeks ago. If you have a pleural effusion where you have fluid, again, that would be draining into these collection chambers as well. Now, this is extremely painful for people, but with that being said, we still need to keep these people moving. We've got to get them to heal. We've got to get that lung tissue going again. We've got to make sure they're taking deep breaths, coughing, using an incentive spirometer. We still get these people up out of bed and we get them into a chair. We walk them. But if we do walk them, it's a, at least a two-person job. One person's just holding the tubes. One person is, you know, working with the patient. So even though these patients are going to hate you, coughing, deep breathing, getting them up out of bed are still going to be important things that as a CNA, we're going to be assisting with. So drainage systems should be below the chest. If you notice any signs of hypoxia, lightheadedness, dizziness, agitation, restlessness, fast breathing, fast heart rate, cyanosis, we need to make sure we talk to the nurse or the respiratory therapist immediately. Tubes, we said, should be coiled up on the bed. Always try to prevent any kinks in the tubing. Make sure that there's no kinks, otherwise it's not going to be draining the excess air or blood or fluid out. We get vital signs as ordered, and vital signs should always include an oxygen saturation on these people. We want to get that O2 sat and make sure it's a normal value, which would be 94, 95 to 100. We turn them still, we reposition them frequently, we do coughing and deep breathing with them, we use that incentive spirometer even though they're going to be uncomfortable, even though they're going to hate us every time we go in to bug them to do it. It's crucial that they keep doing this to get better. And that concludes chapter 40.